Our next speaker is um, Dr. Eldad Hod. Um, Eldad is an assistant professor of pathology and cell biology at Columbia University in New York, where he's the director for the Center for Advanced Laboratory um, Medicine and assistant director of the core labs at the New York uh, Presbyterian Hospital. He is also an attending physician in the Division of Transfusion Medicine and Cell Therapy. His research focuses on examining the effect of modulating iron status on innate immunity and the response to infections, as well as evaluating outcomes of red cell transfusion, including alloimmunization and thrombosis. So he's going to enlighten us on the harmful effects of red cell transfusions. Hold on. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share some of our data today and I'll share some of our unpublished uh, data, especially after the outcomes of the recess enable studies which were recently published. And I'll talk a little bit about what those were for those who don't know what recess enable stands for. So as an outline, I'll talk very briefly about the red cell storage lesion. Then I'll introduce the ERIPI recess able and total studies, which are the four randomized controlled trials that have been published to date on this, on this topic. Um, and then I'll talk about the consequences of the storage lesion on, trans, on the transfusion recipient. And I'll focus on the infectious disease risk for this talk since I only have 20 minutes. Um, and then at the end, I want to reinterpret the results of the RIPI recess able and total studies based on what I'll show, based on the data I'll present to you. Okay, so this is what red cells look like when they come out of a blood donor. So this is on day one um, when you donate blood and you can imagine this is what they're supposed to look like. They're smooth, they have a little dimple and these are normal red cells and no problem over here. This is what they look like after you put them in the refrigerator for 35 to 42 days. And so you can see that some of these red cells look just fine. They're still smooth, they have a dimple. But this red cell over here, you can imagine that it's releasing some, some of its membrane, it's vesiculating. They no longer look right. They look like spiky volleyballs, which are called echinocytes or spheroechinocytes. So you can imagine that those red cells wouldn't circulate very well. So I don't think this part is controversial. So I think everyone would agree that if you put red cells in a refrigerator, there is a storage lesion. Um, what is controversial is does this matter clinically? And so the regulatory agencies in the US and I, I believe in Canada and most of Europe uh, allow red cells to be stored in the refrigerator for up to 42 days. This is dependent on the storage solution you use. Um, and to date, there, were, there have been four large randomized trials on this topic looking at fresh versus standard of care blood. Um, and for the most part, they all suggest that there is no clinical difference between, between giving fresh blood or, or somewhat older blood. And so with these four studies, and the, the first one, the recess in cardiac surgery, ABLE and ICU patients, ERIPI was in neonates and the total study was in kids with malaria. Um, these have all been published and lots of people came up to me and said, well, your research is over. There's nothing to study anymore. There's no problem with old blood. Um, so I'm going to tell you my conclusion up front and then I'll show you some data and we'll, we'll re-examine this. And so my controversial conclusion is that despite these randomized trials, we should be changing the allowable outdate right now and we should reduce it despite these, the results of those studies. And the basis for, for why I'm saying this is our underlying hypothesis is if you transfuse fresh blood, really those red cells are just going to circulate. If when they reach the end of their lifespan, one of those red cells might end up in a macrophage, which eats up senescent red cells, and the macrophage knows what to do with that red cell. It digests the hemoglobin, recycles the iron back to the bone marrow to make a new red cell. However, when you give someone an old unit, and so all these damaged red cells, and I'll show you data to suggest this actually happens, these red cells end up in the macrophage. And um, it, it's really a bolus of red cells that end up in the macrophage. And this overwhelms the macrophage, releases a tremendous amount of iron, which then exits the, the macrophage through ferroportin, which is the channel that allows iron to exit, saturates transferrin, and can produce something called non-transferrin bound iron. So this is a pathologic form of iron. It's iron in the circulation, which it's not really free because you can never have truly free iron. Um, iron's very reactive, it will bind the first thing it sees, so it can bind albumin, citrate, acetate, whatever it sees in the circulation. Um, and so with an old blood transfusion, um, we believe that non-transferrin bound iron is produced, and this could mediate some of the adverse effects such as an infectious risk, which is what I'll focus on today, um, and also cause oxidative damage. 
Now, through a mechanism that we're still trying to work out, um, this may also result in an inflammatory cytokine response and an acute phase response. We see this in mice and dogs. This is yet to be demonstrated in humans. Uh, I won't talk about this today, but at least in animal models, you could show that it does exacerbate a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So what's our evidence? Um, so this is from a recent study that is still ongoing. It's very preliminary, and this is from a single volunteer um, who was transfused fresh blood and old blood, so at 42 days of storage. Um, and we technetium labeled those red cells so that you could actually inject it and then image the whole body and try to see where those red cells are going. Um, and I guess the, the summary of the, or the, the main uh, finding is that you can see three organs light up, the heart, which is where most of the blood is um, that's, that's circulating. Um, but then the main organ that's lighting up is the spleen. And so again, this is just to suggest that in humans, you transfuse old blood and it ends up in the spleen. And you can also see the liver is lighting up as well. Um, and so these are the organs where these old damaged red cells are targeted to after transfusion. Now, of course, in mice, this is a lot easier to do. So you can take mice and transfuse them fresh blood and old blood and simply euthanize them and, and look to see where those red cells are going. And so in this experiment, we took mice, we transfused them with fresh blood, and we looked at the spleen and liver, and we stained the spleen and liver with F480, which is a, a marker of uh, macrophages. And so the brown stain you see are, are the macrophages. It's a little easier to see in the liver where these uh, cupra cells are, are highlighted in brown. And this is what it looks like after a fresh blood transfusion. So you give another cohort of mice a stored blood transfusion. This is now mouse red cells that have been stored. And you can see what happens to the F480 staining. So you can see this cupra cell here is just has these little bubbles in it. And these are actually red cells that the, the red has been washed out with the staining procedure. So again, at least I've shown you in humans that those red cells end up or that the technetium ends up in the spleen and liver. And in mice, you could actually see in the macrophages, in the spleen and liver, um, you can see very nicely that those damaged red cells are being targeted to, to the macrophages. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you at least this part is true. So if you give someone an older blood um, transfusion, that those damaged red cells end up in the macrophage system, predominantly in the spleen and liver. Okay. And so what about this part of it? So what does the macrophage do with red cells um, when they get in there? And so there's an enzyme called hemoxygenase, which breaks up heme, releasing biliverdin, which then gets converted to bilirubin, carbon monoxide, and iron. Okay, And so that iron can then exit through ferroportin, saturate transferrin, and result in increased non-transferrin-bound iron. Um, whoops, wrong way. And so. I'll share with you some uh, data from a study we, we recently compl completed, and the manuscript is now under preparation. But in this study, we took 60 healthy adult volunteers. They each donated one unit of blood, uh, which was stored in AS3 on day one of the study. And then they were randomized to getting a, their, tra their own autologous blood back after one, two, three, four, five, or six weeks of storage. So there were 10 people in each group. And we simply... Um, uh, admitted them to the hospital and took blood samples from them every two hours after the transfusion to see what happens or what we could measure in, in, in the blood. And so this is showing you the delta serum iron. So on the y-axis you have how much the iron increased um, after transfusion and so this is a delta so at baseline before transfusion it's zero and this is immediately after transfusion through 20 hours after transfusion and you can see after one week of storage um, this is an N of 10 in each group um, really iron doesn't change much. If you go to two weeks of storage, no, no, not much of a difference between uh, the two groups. At three weeks, you start to see a difference, although not statistically significant, because there's significant overlap. Uh, four weeks, same thing. Five weeks starts to become uh, significant compared to one week. And then at six weeks, there's a big jump. and. Um, and the six-week group is statistically significantly different than all the other groups. And this is by taking the area under the curve of each person and, and comparing them by ANOVA. And the indirect bilirubin, the change in indirect bilirubin, bear, basically mirrors the iron. And so again, hemoxygenase is going to release biliverdin, which gets converted to bilirubin, and iron from, from those red cells that are, are eaten. And the data would suggest, again, at six weeks, you have this it's, a, it's, a, it's not perfectly linear. So at one and two weeks, you don't see much. And then at six weeks, you see a, a big bump. And so if this um, 
hemolysis was intravascular, so if the red cells were exploding in the vasculature, you'd expect that lactate dehydrogenase would go up because that's an enzyme in, in red cells that, that should go up if, if it's a marker of intravascular hemolysis. And you can see here, uh, when we looked at lactate dehydrogenase levels, there's no difference among the groups, suggesting that pr the predominant form of clearance is extravascular. Um, furthermore, if you look at the delta-free hemoglobin, which again you would expect to go up if this hemolysis was intravascular, we don't see a difference among the groups. Again, to us suggesting that it's predominantly extravascular. I'm not saying there's no intravascular hemolysis going on. It's just we see it as predominantly extravascular. Okay, so back again to the serum iron. So is this amount of iron entering into the circulation enough to, trans, uh, to saturate transferrin? And so, um, so this is the transferrin saturation in each of the subjects. And you can see at baseline, this is not, not a delta anymore. Um, a normal transferrin is between 10 to 30 percent, so that's what we see in our subjects. And you can see here that something happens between 4 hours and 12 hours after a transfusion, and that we can't measure transferrin saturation anymore after 6 weeks of storage, and that's because every lab has an an uh, analytical measuring range, and the transferrin was so saturated it was above the, the range that the, the clinical lab could report, so we couldn't report out a transferrin saturation. And so at 6 weeks of storage, you fully saturate transferrin. Um, and this is the non-transferrin bound iron. So again, if, if iron gets out and doesn't see transferrin first, it's going to bind other things like albumin, citrate, acetate, and your body really doesn't want that to happen. Um, and so in the six-week group, again, you could clearly see a big bump from all the other groups that there is significant non-transferrin bound iron produced after six weeks of storage in the recipient after transfusion. And I'll just show you the spaghetti plots. So there's uh, an N of 10 in each group. And you can see that after six weeks of storage, most of the subjects had significant rises in non-transferrin bound iron. Um, this is not a delta anymore, and some people will notice that if you, with this assay, if you measure non-transferrin bound iron in healthy individuals, it's going to be negative because they actually have, it's lower than the water baseline. Um, but you have a significant increase to the micromolar level in, in subjects getting blood after six weeks of storage, and there's actually one person after five weeks of storage that also has um, non-transferrin bound iron produced, so it's, you know, there is variability between the way people store. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you up to now that the red cells get cleared by the macrophages, they release a lot of iron, it saturates transferrin, especially after six weeks of storage, and non-transferrin bound iron gets produced, but again, who cares what is non-transferrin bound iron bad? Um, and that's actually very difficult to prove and we're still working on it, but I'm just going to show you some evidence on infectious risk and in, in iron. And for, well, fortunately or unfortunately, this, the, the link between iron and infectious risk has been known for a long time. And part of this is that iron deficiency is the largest uh, nutritional deficiency worldwide, and it actually has uh, a poor outcome, uh, or it's associated with neurocognitive delay, especially in children. And so many well-intentioned physicians go to countries to try to give kids iron to, to replete them to prevent this. And unfortunately, whenever they try to do this, bad outcomes happen. And so this is one of the studies that I always cite, um, which occurred in, in um, Polynesia in the 1970s. And at the time in Polynesia, the risk of gram-negative sepsis um, for a neonate who was born was about three in a thousand. And what they decided to do is to give um, each baby iron dextran at birth to combat the iron deficiency. So instead of a vitamin K shot, they got iron, or in addition, they also got iron dextran, and the reason I like this study is that iron dextran, because of the dextran component, it actually targets that iron to macrophages. So effectively, it's sort of like those damaged red cells that are tar targeting hemoglobin iron to macrophages. Iron dextran targets iron to macrophages as well. And so they did this intervention for five years, and what they noticed after five years was that the rate of gram-negative sepsis increased to 17 in 1,000, so it went up six-fold. They stopped the supplementation and, of course, the, the uh, gram-negative sepsis went down. And the most common cause of sepsis was E. coli. And you can see here the temporality of it. So these are babies who are born. They're given IM iron dextran in the first two days of life. And you can see here in gray, those that got the iron dextran um, have a temporally associated increased risk of, of gram-negative sepsis as compared to the uh, control group that did not get the, the iron treatment. So it seems that within two to a week or 10 days after the, the iron dextran, they're getting these infections. So we can similarly model this in mice. So we took mice, we gave them uh, 
an E. coli injection intraperitoneally, and we gave them dextran, which is the control for iron dextran. It's just the carbohydrate component. And in this model, we set it up so that at five days um, after infection, you get about 60% survival. So 60% of the mice are still alive. However, if you give them iron dextran instead, and this is the equivalent iron dose of a two-unit transfusion, you can see what happens to the survival of these mice. And then um, through collaborations with uh, Jim Zimmering, we've developed a, a blood banking uh, system for, for mice, and so this is one of our AS1 units. Um, it's pretty small, but it requires a lot of mice to make. Um, and so we can store these red cell units in the refrigerator, similar to what you would do with human units, and then give them to mice. And if we infuse the mice with, or transfuse the mice with, with fresh blood, you get the same survival curve as with dextran. And then if, again, if we give the same, uh, a two dose, a two unit uh, transfusion of older blood, it looks just like the iron dextran. So they're, they're very similar to each other. So just to show you what this looks like, so the E. coli we use actually expresses luciferase, so you can track where these bacteria are in the mice in vivo in real time because they produce light. So you can see 10 minutes after the intraperitoneal in injection, you can see where these bacteria are, and they're producing a little bit of light. By four hours, whether you got fresh blood or old blood, and this looks the same for dextran and iron dextran, um, the mice are, are starting to become, uh, they're having a severe peritonitis, and, the, and they the infection is taking hold. But if you look at the fresh group, what happens over the next two days is they're able to clear the infection. Some of them um, remain colonized with these luciferase expressing E. coli, so you can actually see it in their stool. But for the most part, they live and, and they don't have a problem. <laughs> Where you can see what happens if you give them old blood or iron dextran is that these mice become completely septic. They're glowing from their tails, from their ears, so they can't control the infection and, and they go on uh, to die. So we've been interested in, in other types of infections that may be um, mediated or that may be enhanced by, by the presence of iron. And, and one area that, that's um, really interesting, uh, at least in our lab for now, is biofilm-associated infections. And so what I showed you just now with the E. coli is these are infections associated with planktonic bacteria. So it's thought that these bacteria are sort of swimming around in the blood. Um, but bacteria also like to grow on surfaces, so they adhere to surfaces, and, that, and then they secrete this slime and grow together as a community, and that slime protects them from antibiotics in your immune system, which is why they prefer to grow in this way. And so the interesting thing is that, uh, especially for pseudomonas, it's been known for quite some time that iron is an important signal for the bacteria to decide whether to adhere to a surface or not. So the rationale for this, we don't obviously know what the bacteria are thinking or why they evolved this way, but you, know, you don't want to stick to a surface if you don't have the nutrients you need to grow. And so if you actually look at pseudomonas under a microscope, and this is a single bacterium that's, that was being tracked in this experiment, and you put it in a medium without iron, you could see that the, the pseudomona sort of swims around, they divide, they swim around, they divide, the granddaughters divide, and, and they're everywhere. They don't adhere. Where if you incubate them with iron in the medium, then the parent cell will eventually settle down somewhere, and all the daughter cells will be in the same spot because they've now adhered and decided to begin making a colony. And so we can take human serum, and this is uh, human serum with increasing transferrin saturation. And these last two groups actually have a fully saturated transferrin with an NTBI that's very similar to the amount that we see after transfusion of older blood. And then we, do, we can grow biofilms in wells in a dish, and this is a, a biofilm assay, and you could see that there's a clear bump once the NTBI is present. So it's not necessarily that there's, there's more iron over here, but it's not until you get free iron, in a sense, that, this biofil that the signaling happens to make the pseudomonas stick to the, to the surface. And so what does this look like in mice? So these are catheterized mice. They have catheters in their heart. And again, we simply gave them pseudomonas. This time it's a luciferase expressing strain, but we gave it through their tails. And we're imaging them. And you can see here that after fresh blood, a couple of them are starting to light up over their catheters. But in the old blood group, they're all lighting up over their catheters. And they have increased mortality with, with this treatment. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that at least with an infectious risk, without antibiotics in mice, old blood can be bad and it creates non-transparent bound iron, but the real controversy is this. So I can show you studies in, in, that um, older red cells cause hemolysis in mice, dogs, and humans. That I don't think that's a controversy. 
Um, and I can point you to articles and, and well-designed experimental evidence to suggest that the adverse effects are observed in mice and dogs, um, but all the RCTs to date do not support the clinical effects in humans. So let's take a closer look at these studies. And I just want to preface this by saying I don't think there's anything wrong with the studies. I think these are great studies. They answer very important clinical questions. My issue is just with the interpretation of the studies. Um, by some people, not by, by everyone. Um, so this is the Arepi study, which uh, came out of Canada. Um, and this was published in 2012. And this was done in neonates. And basically, in this study, they randomized their neonates to really fresh blood less than seven days of, of age versus standard of care, which the standard of care in these sites where they did the study was pretty good. It was 14.6 days. Um, and they didn't notice a difference in neonatal morbidity. So effectively, th this is the age of blood that was used in their standard of care group. And you can see there's very few units over 21 days of age. And so effectively, what they did in this study was they compared one-week-old blood to two-week-old blood. And I wouldn't expect there to be a difference if you believe hemolysis is, is responsible for the adverse effects. And th it might not be, but that, that's what we believe. Okay, so now let's look at the ABLE study, which was recently published in the New England Journal, um, also came out of, of Canada, and this was in ICU patients. And again, a similar situation. This was not fresh versus old. It was fresh versus standard of care. And the standard of care in Canada is, is pretty good. And, you know, not many units over 28 days of age. And if you believe that non-transferrin bound iron is a mediator of adverse effects, you wouldn't expect to see it until you randomize people to blood grow greater than 35 days of, of age. So again, potentially why we, we didn't see an effect, a clinical outcome, a clinical outcome difference in, in the ABLE study. So now the RESIS study. This was a study um, uh, which we actually part, we were, were a site in, um, in uh, patients undergoing cardiac surgery. And they actually randomized to fresh versus old, but the ethical boards didn't allow old to be too old, so it was 21 days of age. Um, but one can argue there was pretty good separation between the fresh blood and the old blood, so most of the blood was greater than 21 days, and there was this, you know, there were, there were some uh, units that were greater than 35 days of age, so you would expect maybe we should see a clinical difference. Um, and in fact, there was no clinical outcome difference. They looked at multi-organ dysfunction scores, mortality, medium, median stay in the ICU, and so no difference, no difference in outcome. And so what do I think might be part of the issue with this is that um, um, the population that was chosen for this study, um, very important population clinically, because um, we transfuse them a lot, but if you want to answer the question of is old blood bad, might not be the the population to choose, but that wasn't the aim of the study. Um, so 96% of the patients on this, in the study were on cardiac bypass for at least two hours, for a median of two hours, because they needed to get patients undergoing complex cardiac surgery. So it's well known that if you put a patient on bypass for two hours, they hemolyze a lot just from the bypass itself, from the, from the pump. So this is, these are studies just showing how much plasma-free hemoglobin you have in patients undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass. And so it's a tremendous amount of, of hemoglobin being released from the bypass itself. And again, 96% of the patients in this study were undergoing bypass. And so, um, so basically what was happening in the recess study was that um, the baseline level of hemolysis was sort of like what I drew in the, in the rectangle. It was very high from the, the pump. And then... Um, you know, I, we were a participant in the study, so if someone was lucky enough to get a really old blood unit greater than 35 days, they maybe got one or two units, so you're giving them a little bit of extra hemolysis from the unit, but I wouldn't expect to see a clinical outcome difference because that baseline level of hemolysis is, is, is so high to begin with. And that brings us finally to the total study, which was recently published in, in JAMA. And here again, they randomized, uh, these were kids um, with severe anemia from sickle cell disease and malaria. Um, they all came in hemolyzing from the malaria and the sickle cell disease with hemoglobins less than five. Um, they did have significant differences in the uh, age of the units, but of course in Uganda, they decide to limit their um, outdate to 35 days. So no unit older than 35 days was used. Um, so their outcome was lactate levels, not clinical outcomes, but there were no differences in clinical outcomes. And again, they didn't test blood greater than 35 days. And the underlying illness, again, was hemolytic. So again, not a population where you would expect one or two units of old blood to make too much of a difference. So in conclusion, does red cell transfusion cause any side effects? 
Hopefully I've convinced you at the very least that it causes extravascular hemolysis. You will see bilirubin go up, you'll see iron go up, you'll see transferrin saturation go up, non-transferrin bind iron go up. I didn't show you data, but hepcidin goes up, ferritin goes up, um, which all would make sense uh, physiologically. Um, are these side effects bad? Well, if you rig the system in animal models, you can make it bad. So yes, in, in mice and dogs, in certain circumstances, it remains to be determined in humans. Um, and although the recent randomized control trials provide useful clinical evidence, they do not address the question of is old blood bad? Okay, they're very important clinically, but they, they don't address that question. And so my provocative conclusion is this, that if, and if we cannot pre perform the randomized control trial, because the ethical boards actually won't allow us to randomize patients to blood greater than 35 days, so we can't even do the appropriate randomized control trial to test the hypothesis, I would argue that the precautionary principle suggests that we shouldn't even be doing it in patients and that we should change our outdate, for example, to, based on the non-transferrin bound iron data to at least 35 days. Um, and that's open for discussion and you can throw things at me if you want, but that, that's what I believe. Um, and so finally, just to acknowledge, um, you know, clearly this work was done in, in, in a large collaborative group. I, I work very closely with Steve Spitalnik and Gary Brinham and all these ideas we sort of come up with together and, and make happen together. And finally, just one more plug, because today is uh, it's interesting. So th these are my kids um, with the Canadian flag. We're, we all came over uh, to Canada together, um, so we're here for the week. Um, uh, and so some of us are very concerned about the way the election is going in, in the states. <laughs> and uh, I heard on the way over here that Canada is building a wall to try to prevent Americans <laughs> from coming over after the election. So I'm just, you know, we have really great kids. I really love them a lot. <laughs> Don't forget us if, if the wrong person gets elected. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, uh, one thing that I wasn't following, though, is uh, it looked to me uh, that your uh, transferrin iron, you measured out to 20 hours in, in the human study, the autologous study, and, and then it renor uh, the free iron renormalized. So you really only have a very transient period where, where iron is increased. So presumably that would be the transient period. And obviously iron homeostasis is going to take over in, in people anyway, and they're going, to absorb, uh, they're going to absorb less iron if they're iron overloaded. So I'm wondering, how do you associate that with uh, poor outcomes? Uh, they would have to be immediately poor outcomes right after the transfusion. Is that the reasoning? Well, so, you know, it depends on the population of interest, so, or the population you choose. So I can imagine in, in a trauma situation, if you're, you've been injured in your abdomen, you now have E. coli everywhere, and now you're, tr you're, you're transfused many units because uh, you're bleeding, um, these patients, at least in the States, we often give them the oldest blood because we say they're young, they've undergone trauma, they're going to need many units, they get a lot of old bloods very rap a lot of old blood very rapidly, and they have a high risk for infection. Um, surgeons uh, have arrangements not to get the oldest blood from their blood banks? So it depends on the site. So, you know, there are no standards of practice for sickle, I mean, for many populations across the states. And so some sites do, some sites don't. They say it's FDA approved, so, you know, they get whatever. Um, but it, in any case, that would be a situation where it, where it might matter. I agree with you completely. It's not going to matter for everyone. And the other important thing, if you're going to look at infection as an outcome, not all bacteria are the same, so I didn't show you negative data. Um, if you use Staph aureus, for example, you don't get the same effect because different bacteria obtain iron in different ways. And so certain bacteria are very ferrophilic. They need that free iron to, to grow, where Staph aureus has other ways of getting iron. And this doesn't, at least in mice, does not work with, with Staph aureus. And so, you know, if you're using infection as an outcome, you have to consider which, which type of infection you're looking at. And it, it sorry, it also gets even more complicated when you add antibiotics into the mix, um, because that is also going to change, change the effect. Hi, yes, over here. Uh, very nice talk. I, I was wondering, um, how common is it for transfusions uh, to use units over 35 days? And with that, what would be the consequence of, of changing the, uh, the best-by date? So 
Um, again, it depends on where you practice. I think it's anywhere between five to 20 percent, uh, from my reading. But you know, th there's been a lot of good studies that suggest that if you decrease it at least to 35 days, it's not going to harm the inventory that much. I would argue that the UK has already done it, the Netherlands have done it, Japan uses 21 days, and I think the NIH has changed to to 35 days in the United States. But that's just one site. So some you know, big countries have decided to decrease to 35 days with no adverse outcome um, that I know of. But there are some editorials suggesting that it, it would harm the inventory, and so that, that is a major issue that one must consider. So I'll add, this may be naive, but um, your experiments or the studies are using traditional standard approaches to transfuse. So are there other approaches to transfusing, so smaller instead of bolus? And, and they may not necessarily be practical in all situations, but can we give a blood transfusions over a longer period of time? Is there time to recover in terms of the transfer in levels? I don't know how fast the iron is cleared. Um, the macrophage is recovering. Are there other strategies that can be considered cons uh, in light of the, you know, you want the, the most out of your blood supply? Sure, sure. Um, well, so one of the other outcomes we were, uh, I'm, I guess I'm, I won't exactly answer your question, but one of the other outcomes we, were, we, we see that we see in mice and dogs is there's also an inflammatory response that's associated with the transfusion. And we thought that maybe the, the duration of, of time that you give the transfusion affects that. So if you give a bolus, it's really bad for the macrophages and that will cause them to produce cytokines where if you give it more slowly, it, it won't. So we actually did that study in dogs where we gave it um, very rapidly. Within five minutes, we gave dogs two units or we spread it out over two hours. It made no difference in their inflammatory cytokine response. So the dogs made cytokines whether you gave it slowly or, or rapidly. As far as the iron aspect, um, it's, it's a lot more complicated because um, patients are different than the healthy volunteers I showed you in our studies. So we use healthy volunteers, so at least they're human but they're still not the patients we transfuse. And if you, when you transfuse patients, they're sick, they're inflamed, and so their hepcidin levels at baseline are very high. And so what happens to the iron under those situations is different than what I showed you with healthy volunteers. So it's, it's a limitation of what I showed you that we're aware of, but then that iron gets trapped in the macrophage and can't get out because hepcidin is, is high, and so that has other impacts. And if you're an intracellular, I didn't show you data with salmonella, which is an intracellular pathogen, those actually um, they do, uh, so there's effects with intracellular bacteria as well. So if you can't get the iron out, it's going to still end up in the, in the macrophage. Uh, I remember re reading a quite entertaining book from your colleague of yours at Mount Sinai, down the road at least. Uh, it was called The Survival of the Sickiest. Okay. And so one of the chapters dealt with hem hemochromatosis. And he claimed that essentially hemochromatosis was one of the survival factors in the proponic plaque in the Middle Ages. So it was essentially anti-infectious. Uh, right. So how does it explain so, it? So, for example, that and also uh, there, there's a link or there's a suggestion that uh, hemochromatosis might be protective for uh, TB as well, um, tuberculosis. And the, the thought behind it is actually if you look at the pathophysiology of hemochromatosis, it's a disorder where your hepcidin levels are too low for what it should be. And if you look at the macrophage in hemochromatosis patients, they're actually iron de deplete, not replete. So because the hepcidin levels are too low, the macrophages don't hold on to iron very well. And so it might be that that, so for intracellular pathogens like tuberculosis, which like to grow in macrophages and need iron to grow, that prevents them from being able to replicate. So it might be a factor on what the, in hemochromatosis, they're iron overloaded, but the macrophages are actually iron de deficient, and that might have an impact on an inflammatory response and how they deal with intracellular pathogens. Eldad, the, uh, you know, iron loss does increase as storage time increases, but the effect of one donor versus another is at least three times as great and it's also possible to offset this with better storage systems, as the history of storage systems clearly shows. You know, we've increased storage from three to six weeks, and every time the recovery has gotten better. Uh, you know, is, is this the appropriate response, I guess, you know, to the current crisis, if there is one? So I didn't, um, because I only had 20 minutes, I didn't have time to, to go into this in more detail, but 
Um, what I didn't show you is how much variability there is between all the, the subjects. And there was tremendous variability. So there are some people at six weeks who look like two weeks, and some people, at least there was one person who stood out at three weeks who looked like six weeks. And so there's a lot of variability that we still don't understand. And so potentially making better storage solutions would address that. Um, but this was AS3, which I, I know there's, there's other solutions out there that might be better, but with AS3, this, this is what we saw, and there were, um, we also did chromium survival studies, and, and at least one of these subjects after 42 days of storage had a survival of 65%, which means 35% of the unit you transfused, 35% of the red cells that were infused disappeared from the circulation within the 20 hours of, of this experiment. So that's a tremendous amount of iron if you think about it. Every unit of blood has 250 milligrams of iron. So if you clear 35% of that, that's a huge amount of iron. And also, you transfuse to get the red cells to circulate. So if 35% are being cleared, that's not a good outcome in, in patients, in my mind.